Thanks, heaps. It's, um, it's great to be here. Um, welcome to day two. Um, it's, it's always a, an exciting time at conferences. I love to, to come and kind of meet people and see kind of the way, they, their, the way they do life, the way they um, learn things, the way they think about things. Uh, it's one of my favourite things about coding uh, in peers is you notice these little kind of keystrokes people do, these little techniques they use that you don't see in your own coding because you, you don't know them. Um, so I, what I love is this kind of way that we can interact with each other and, and learn more and more things. Um, a bit about me, yeah, I live here in Wellington. Um, I have three crazy boys at primary school that um, help me avoid that pesky thing called sleep. Um, I've, uh, yeah, as, uh, I've, I've just started working at Endgame after a, a stint teaching at Inspiral Dev Academy. It was a, a, an amazing um, privilege to, to get to teach people how to code and to kind of share some of the things I'd learned about uh, what it is to, to write software. Uh, I'm a staunch generalist. Um, I've done some teaching. I've built some APIs. I've done some front end and some back end and some back end for front end and some front end for back end. I've done some security things that I'm not allowed to talk about. Um, I'm also old. Uh, I once wrote a thing with prototype JS, uh, if you remember that. But don't worry, I later upgraded it to use jQuery. Um, had I continued on in the project, I probably would have upgraded. Oh, actually, no, I did. I upgraded it one more time. I wrote CoffeeScript that time. Um, back in those days where it was this crazy idea that we would transpile our JavaScript. Um, then, uh, had I continued on, I probably would have written it in maybe vanilla JS with no dependencies. That was the thing at the time, but um, then later maybe I would have gone to TypeScript, added Jest, and then put all those dependencies, like the entire internet of dependencies, back in when adding Jest. Um, I've, I, I guess it's probably a good time to talk about some of the accolades of my career uh, in, in front-end development uh, and beyond. Uh, I once wrote a Java applet, uh, if, if you remember those. Awful, awful thing. Uh, I controlled it with JavaScript, though, so give me some credit. Um, I also uh, had a wee play with this thing called uh, Google Web Toolkit. Does anyone remember that? It was an amazing piece of kit from Google. It allowed you to do away with that pesky JavaScript entirely and instead use a slow and verbose language like Java to write your front end. What was even better about it was uh, you didn't even have to write CSS. You could write that in Java, too. And then you could compile that, that Java into JavaScript and run it in the browser. Of course, when it broke, we didn't have dev maps in the same way we do now, so when it broke, you just had to read a JavaScript um, stack trace and see if you could work out where in your Java code that went wrong. They were good times. Uh, when, it, when I kind of got into more, more modern development with React, it was, it was with that context in mind that I grew to love Webpack. Um, even though every now and then I would lose a day or two trying to get my CSS back out again. Um, though, at least I got to write JavaScript and CSS. Uh, today, what I want to talk to you about um, are two things that I love, two things that I hold dear, two things that uh, will be no surprise to you, uh, given our industry, that they are passions of mine. Um, the first... Is, is something that is uh, fairly important to me. It's fairly important to a lot of people. In fact, it may well be the trigger of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, that is coffee. Uh, I love coffee. I love to drink coffee. I love to geek out about coffee. Um, but most of all, I love what you learn when you learn more and more about coffee. More on that later. The other thing I want to talk about is this thing that's a real hassle. Uh, this thing that kind of dri drives us, uh, us nuts at times. Um, I would be able to sit alone in a room and write beautiful code on your own without the interruptions of pesky clients and co-workers. I want to talk to you a little bit about teams today. Wouldn't life be much simpler if we didn't work in teams? However, that's not the case. I realise this is kind of a, an interruption to your regularly scheduled programming. Oh, hang on, I've got a picture of Teams. Now, I want to show you this picture of Teams. If you, if you ever go looking for slides uh, and you, you Google the word team, it's, it's, just, it's a magical experience. You know, if you look for coffee, you, know, you get a bottomless porter filter pouring out beautiful espresso. But if you look for Teams, someone has this weird idea of what a team is. I mean, look at these two up the back here. If you notice, they're actually both holding the laptop. 
Like, this is what teamwork is on the internet. No wonder we have a messed up view of teams. But anyway, don't worry. Look at them. What a great time they're having. This talk is not a talk about technical things. This is a talk, maybe if you will, uh, is a talk about how to get the most out of your technical things. It's not a talk about hardware. It's not a talk about software. Today, I want to delve into the wetware. Today, I want to tell you a story about teams and coffee. The story today takes place a long way away in England, not too long ago, in a place called Bath, and a man called Maxwell Colliner Dashwood. If you haven't heard of him, that's fine. He was only at one time, in fact, at the time of our story, the greatest barista in the UK. As we meet him, Colliner Dashwood runs a small specialty coffee shop in Bath. It's called Colonna and Smalls. But as we meet him today in our story, Colin Dashwood has a problem. He has sourced some rare specialty coffee. He's visited the roaster, tasted their wares, agreed on their excellence. He's ordered the beans, they've arrived in the shop. And he has lovingly ground them to the exact grind using a conical ceramic burr grinder. I think it's this one here. Oh, actually, all three of those are grinders. Um, he's weighed the dose. He's tamped it to the exact compression. He's loaded his porter filter in this exquisite machine. This machine would require a small mortgage to pay for. The machine has applied nine bars of pressure and it has forced hot water through these grounds for exactly 34 seconds, producing exactly 50 grams of crema laden espresso. He picks up the shot glass with the espresso in it. He gives it a swirl to keep it active. He lifts it to his lips, closes his eyes and sips. But all is not well in Bath today. The espresso is not exotic. It's not floral, it's not pungent, it's not playful, it's not complex. It is flat, dull, and bitter. Perplexed, Colin Dashwood surveys, surveys this vast array of equipment. His eyes settle on the beans in the grinder. He stares at his new beans. Sitting at his laptop later, he authors an email to the roaster. <laughs> of course, what else could be the problem? It clearly that the beans are at fault. At this point, I, I kind of feel the, uh, the need to point out that in the absence of the exact emails, uh, the authentic emails, the author of the story has, in fact, exercised his right to poetic license. My boss used to say, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Anyway, a few days pass, and Maxwell receives a reply. Maxwell looks up from his laptop, and again he surveys his equipment. This time his eyes fall on another piece of equipment, his water filter. Meanwhile, in another part of the world, a slightly bigger place and a slightly bigger company also have a problem. The place is San Jose, and the company is Google. Perhaps you've heard of them. As we join Google in our story, they have collected a massive array of, of data points relating to the makeup of teams within their, within their organization and their effectiveness. They're on the very Google ever-expanding quest to maximize productivity. They're trying to decode teams. The project is codenamed Aristotle aptly named after the philosopher uh, because of his quote, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. However, like in Bath, all is not well in San Jose today. After a massive research effort, they are stumped. There is no pattern to the data. However they stack it, they rule out personality types decision-making styles, the average performance of individuals. 
the who of teams seems irrelevant to the performance of the teams. Like Colin and Dashwood, they have the best equipment. They control all the variables. But they can't find a way to reliably produce the product they want. In Google's case, a highly effective team. They look at team culture. They look at meeting culture. In some teams, people constantly interrupt each other. In other teams, uh, supervisors and everyone takes turns. But again, no patterns emerge that leads to performance. No variable they isolate makes any difference at all. But as we can all guess, the researchers are relentless. And of course, they crack the code. The answer is psychological safety. The trust and empathy that underpins our relationships and, and the relationships within a team ultimately predicts the team's performance. Do people feel safe? Do they feel, feel safe enough to share ideas, to take risks, to disagree? It seems that our productivity is ultimately tied to our humanity. Our relationships hold our work together. But what of Colin Dashwood? As it turns out, the University of Bath is not far from our protagonist's specialty coffee store. And it has a thriving chemistry department. And so when one of the professors of the chemistry department wanders in to the shop one day, Colin Dashwood seizes his opportunity. And what follows is a number of published papers exploring the role of chemistry in coffee brew water. It studies the interactions that the water has with the coffee and a new dawn of understanding of how baristas need to control the presence of certain minerals in their water. Undoubtedly an apology to a roaster ensues. But most importantly what follows is vibrant, fruity, and pungent espresso. Now, as you may have guessed, I'm not talking just about coffee. You see, as you already know, software isn't built in a vacuum. Software is a team sport. And the coffee? Well, the coffee is a metaphor. You see, in this story, coffee is your coding skills and your technical prowess. Unquestionably important skills in fact, as unquestionably important as meticulously grown, carefully processed, and perfectly roasted coffee. And yet, the coffee in your cup makes up 2% of the final product. An espresso is 98% water, though it's often the forgotten ingredient. And this is where it gets interesting. What I love learning about coffee and water is what makes them work together. What I love most about what Colin and Dashwood discovered is this. The two most important ingredients in coffee brew water are calcium and magnesium. The ions, not the metals. Don't put, coffee or, uh, don't put calcium or magnesium in your coffee. It will explode. Um, these metal ions are, are present among a, a, a variety of others. The total dissolved solids is something we've, we've tracked in coffee for a long time. But magnesium and calcium are special because they have the most, or they sit at the very top of a particular scale. And this scale measures what chemistry calls binding energy. These two, more than any other, form strong bonds with, with, with the parts of the coffee that we want in our cup. I love that. The thing that makes beautiful coffee beans produce the perfect espresso is the same thing that decides whether your honed technical skills will produce quality software products. Binding energy, trust, empathy, listening, relationship, connection binding energy. If you want great software, you need to build great teams. Foster connection, identity, respect, belonging. And remember, we're talking at team level here. 
not at company level. This is not a reminder of company culture. I'm not asking you to redo your corporate values and add teamwork to the list and high five. The research coming out is that team culture has much more influence on your experience of a company than company culture does. Good teams can thrive in awful companies, and you can have an awful experience in a great company. You need to be thinking about how to make people feel safe at a very deep level. Safe enough to bring their whole selves to work. You have to remember that as we strive for more diverse teams, we're going to lose some of the things that we've automatically relied on in the past. We need to upgrade this thinking of people, these people are like me. We need to replace it. We need to let it evolve into these people like me. And I know that, that, that that's a long way off in many respects. This may take some patience. But you know, it might also take some impatience. Because it's been long enough that we've accepted the types of cultures that emerge at times in tech. It's time to fix our water. We come to events like this generally with the view to hone our technical skills, to move to our edge, to discover the next thing, to sharpen our tools. This is an important exercise. Having said that, I want to give you a challenge today. As you listen to the talks and develop your craft, also take some time to reflect on the companies you work for and the companies you work with, the teams you find yourself in, and ask yourself the question. As you reflect, remember San Jose, remember Bath, remember what Google knows, remember what Colin Dashwood knows, and what you know, and ask yourself, how's the water here? As you consider the companies you work for, and the teams that are within them. Give it to them straight in the interviews. Ask them, how's the water here? Aristotle said, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. I wonder, at least, if in tech, up until recently, he was wrong. My challenge to you is to prove him right. Have a wonderful day. I hope you enjoy yourselves.